as uh, Daryl mentioned, I'm going to give you an overview to understand NIH policy on sex as a biological variable, which we call SABV, and the importance of sex and gender in biomedical research. Next, please. Before we begin, I wanted to share good news that we just celebrated seventh anniversary of sex as a biological variable, or I might be using SABV policy in January, and it was enacted in January 2016. Next, please. In 2014, oh, next slide. In 2014, in Nature Journal, Janine Clayton and Francis Collins unveiled NIH policy to ensure that preclinical research considers both females and males. Next, please. This nature publication led to publication of NIH landmark, landmark policy, sex as a biological variable, which set new expectation for applicants. Next, please. To begin, I would like to introduce you to the Office of Research on Women's Health, or ORWH. ORWH is the first public health service office dedicated specifically to promote women's health research within and beyond NIS scientific community. ORWH was established in September 1990. The mission of the office is to enhance and expand women's health research, include women and minority groups in clinical research, and promote career advancement for women in biomedical careers. ORWH crafts and implements the NIH strategic plan for women's health research in partnership with NIH institute centers and offices and co-fund research on the role of sex and gender on health. The strategic plan has the NIH vision which calls for sex and gender to be integrated into biomedical research, every woman to receive evidence-based care women in science careers to reach their full potential. The study of how sex and gender influence health and disease is central to the NIH mission of enhancing health, extending life, and reducing illness for all people. Together with others in the NIH community, ORWH is committed to setting the example across scientific research that consideration of sex and gender is critical for rigorous and responsible science and for establishing a future in which every person can receive safe, effective, and evidence-based medical care. Next slide. In the next few slides, I will explain why the Office of Research on Women's Health and why it was established. Next, please. Next. 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 So ORWH is committed to understanding influences of sex and gender on health and disease at every level, from preclinical to translational to clinical research studies or clinical trials, from sex-specific data analysis, education, and uh, to animal studies, and sex-specific reporting, health policy, and healthcare. Next, please. So it becomes important to understand, is there any difference between sex and gender? And what are the sex and gender and why do they matter? It is critical to understand the importance of sex and gender in human health and disease. Although many times sex is incorrectly or sometimes synonymously used as gender. In fact, both terms describe different but connected constructs. Sex and gender shape health independently as distinct factors as well as interactively through the many ways in which they intersect and influence each other. It is important to understand the differences and interaction between sex and gender to better, better understand how they affect health and why they are important in medical practice and biomedical research. Based on National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, NASM report of 2022, Sex is multidimensional biological construct based on anatomy, physiology, genetics, and hormones. These components are sometimes referred as sex traits, whereas gender can be broadly defined as multidimensional construct that encompasses gender identity and expression, as well as social and cultural expectations about the status, characteristics, and behavior as they are associated with certain sex traits. 
The study of how sex and gender influence health and disease is central to the NIH mission and ORWH is committed to setting the example across biomedical research. That consideration of sex and gender is essential for rigorous and reporting, reporting reproducible science. For more information about sex and gender, please visit the ORWH website and look for the sex and gender section. Next, please. So why does it matter? Next. So sex has effects at multiple levels of biology. Next, please. Whether it is cells, genes, intracellular processes. Next, please. Or at the system level, for example, immune system, which affects and it is affected by other systems. Next, please. Or organism as a whole. So differences in disease manifestation to response to prescriptions and all levels interact and influence each other simultaneously. Next, please. Sex factors are important because sex specific factors govern differences in the prevalence to disease, how women and men present with disease, the course and outcome of disease. As you can see, they may start at a different point. They will, they will go overlap at one point and then they go in different direction. Next, please. Women and men differ in numerous parameters, whether it is physical, emotional, biological, or something else. Among others, women have a lower total body weight, a higher proportion of body fat, a lower body surface area, a lower muscle mass, a smaller organ size, lower glomerular filtration rate, and lower gastric acid ex excretion. These factors may influence drug disposition, physiological differences such as hormonal fluctuations during the menstrual cycle may also influence drug pharmacokinetics or PK. Menstrual cycle variations do occur in renal, cardiovascular, and hematological system with the potential to impact protein binding and volume of distribution. Similarly, hormonal changes during menopause, pregnancy, and hormonal contraceptive therapy are likely to have the same effects. The problem is that many drugs are developed and optimized in men using 70 kilogram male as a standard. In fact, in 2000, the GEO, which is Government Accountability Office, examined several drugs that were approved by FDA for widespread use and then later pulled for safety issues. Eight out of 10 of these drugs posed more of a threat for women. Understanding the mechanisms of sex differences in drug therapy is critical for optimal dosing in both sexes. Evaluation of sex differences in PK pharmacokinetics of drugs will further enhance understanding of sex-based differences in the safety and efficacy of drugs and minimize therapeutic adverse events. PK differences are the most common sex differences and early detection of these differences during drug development can lead to clinical trial design that will use sex-based dosing and better individualization. Because men, and women may differ in a specific drug PK, it is essential to understand those sex differences in drug disposition and responses, as in turn, they may affect drug safety and effectiveness. As an example, lipophilic drugs like diazepam, nitrosopam, and others have slower clearance, higher tissue accumulation, and exposure-related adverse reactions in women. Next, please. So three big changes that go hand to hand to advance the health of women. Number one, from focus of reproductive health to health over the life course and from head to toe. Next, toward a multidimensional framework that addresses all factors affecting health. And the last one is study of sex as a biological variable. Next, please. Next. It's not moving. Give me one second. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So, as I said, NIH published uh, in 2015 its landmark study, Sex as a Biological Variable Policy. Next, please. In the policy, NIH expects that sex as a biological variable will be factored into research 
designs, analyses, and reporting in vertebrate, animal, and human studies. Next, please. Giving you an example that one size does not fit all. Susan Chang, who is at Cedar Sinai Hospital in LA, she is one of our grantees, and uh, she published this landmark study. So we all know that plus pressure guidelines state that women and men have same normal healthy range of BP, which is systolic upper limit of 120 millimeter of mercury. And above threshold is associated with risk for heart attack, heart failure, stroke, etc. Susan Chang showed that women have lower normal systolic blood pressure range compared to men. A study found increasing cardiovascular, di cardiovascular disease risk beginning at lower threshold of systolic blood pressure for women than for men. Because the current, why this is important, this finding, because the guidelines do not account for sex differences, they may be detrimental to women's health. So it is important to revisit hypertension treatment guidelines that do not account for sex differences. Next, please. Until recently, basic and preclinical biomedical research has focused on male animals and cells from male animals. And over-reliance on male animals and cells from males may obscure understanding of key sex influences on health processes and outcomes. NIH expects that sex as a biological variable to be factored into research designs analyses and reporting in vertebrate animal and human studies. A strong justification from scientific literature, preclinical data or other relevant consideration must be provided for applications proposing to study only one sex. Accounting for SABB begins with the development of research questions and study design. It also includes data collection and analysis of results, as well as reporting of findings. Consideration of sex may be critical to the interpretation, validation, and generalizability of research findings. Adequate consideration of both sexes in experiments and disaggregation of data by sex allows for sex-based comparison and may inform clinical interventions. Appropriate analyses and transparent reporting of data by sex may therefore enhance the rigor and applicability of preclinical biomedical research. Next. So NIH SABB policy, what are the achievements so far? So seven years is a brief period in the world of biomedical research. As I mentioned in my second slide that we just celebrated the seventh anniversary, but in the last seven years, since NIH enacted its pioneering policy on SABV, there has been a lot of activities, including impressive research findings, a marked increase in media and attention by scientific journals on sex differences and influences, great enthusiasm from researchers and many questions and requests from assistants. I am pleased to announce that ORWH has developed many resources. ORWH has added multiple resources. I'll come to that. Next slide, please. So few more examples, what more needs to be done? Next, please. So Vitochek and colleagues performed a meta-analysis of 10-year publication data from 2009 to 2019 of sex inclusion in biological science and observed increases in consideration of sex and gender. So next, please. Next, next. Oops, oh, go back, please. Okay, next. Oh. It's going, okay, so go back. Something is not, go back, please. Okay, so there are significant increases in the field such as neurology, immunology, endocrinology, and physiology. And yes, happily, the number of studies that provided an evidence-based rationale for a single sex study increased also, consistent with the SAVV policy. Unfortunately, when it comes to sex-based analyses, that is part of SABV policy, we see that only one field, uh, is there any way? Next. Oh, yes. Next. 
next yeah just wait only one field pharmacology has shown improvement in sex based analyses when you compare studies done in 2009 with the studies done in 2019 actually when looking across all discipline studies the percentage of articles that performed sex based analyses went down from 2009 to 2019 the publication and other similar studies highlight and confirms the need of continued education awareness and advocacy for the inclusion of sex and gender including the consideration of sbv in biomedical research next please i just want to give you some data on covid-19 pandemic the data is from global health 5050 and you will see that there are still gaps even though we have seen in the media as well as in scientific reports that more men are dying because of this but it has significantly affected the female population so there is definitely a gap in covid-19 trials and still the data is not being reported based on sex or disaggregated so zero stratified subjects by sex in their design one is stratified data by sex in an after the fact analysis so we have a number of missing things here and this is a publication also from shifer et al so you can see on the left hand side the data that there is a sex based differences next please some journals have taken proactive steps to in force changes in reporting practice in addition to the development of the seger guidelines this is from canada in 2019 judy regensteiner and her colleagues published an article in lancet advanced advocating integrating sex and gender consideration in research education educating the scientific workforce without changes in public publishing practices even when we make changes in policy we won't experience the full benefit of this change and our ability to improve the health of women and men will be limited a number of societies and associations are having their own platform sessions on this topic showing a high level of enthusiasm for uptake of policy and there was also a publication in science recently in september and where the authors have published a framework for sex gender and diversity analysis in research next please i will give you some programs how orwh advances sex study of sex and gender and the health of women through collaboration across nih next please so we have an r01 program which is intersection of sex and gender influences on health and disease and uh, 11 NIH institute center and offices participate in this initiative next please we have another one which is a score specialized centers of research excellence it's a cooperative agreement supported as u54 and eight ics are participating this is the only disease agnostic centers program at nih next please we have administrative supplements program sex and gender administrative supplement as well as under studied under represented and under reported which we call u3 administrative supplement program and 26 ics participate in these uh, administrative supplement programs next please and we have a batch which is building interdisciplinary research careers in women tell supported as k12 mechanism and seven icos part partner in this uh, initiative and it's a mentored career development program next please so orwh as i briefly mentioned has developed many resources and here are some of those e learning programs which can be utilized for your further advancement so one is bench to bed side integrating sex and gender to improve human health the other one is sex as a biological variable primer and introduction to the scientific basis of sex and gender related differences as of august 2022 a total of 19 more than 1900 individuals have registered for these courses and out of which 1190 individuals have completed the bench to bed side course while more than 
700 individuals have completed the SABV primer course. And when we look some characteristics of these investigators, 81% were female, 16% were male, 1% was transgender, and 2% none of the above. They declined to disclose. And uh, when we look for ethnicity, 11% of learners reported Hispanics, 81% reported non-Hispanic, and 8% declined to answer. And out of those 62% were white, 14% were Asian, and 11% were Black or African American. And most of the learners are in academia or university sector, and some were also like patient retired or self-employed or unemployed. And employment status, most of them were researchers, and uh, but we also had 18% students and uh, patient care investigators also approximately 14%. Next, please. So this is, again, if you are interested in learning, please go ahead and register. Next, please using this link for the primer and so more information on the primer as well as uh, the video link. Next, please. I'm happy to inform that media has shown a great attention to SABV. So CNN has published blood pressure may need to be monitored differently according to a new study, the one which I highlighted in my presentation. New York Times also reported women report worse side effects after COVID vaccine morning concert, NPR. And we also had a congressional briefing and a scientific journal like Nature Neuroscience and Drug Monkey blog, they published considering sex or biological value will require a global shift in science culture. Endocrine news, biological psychiatry and ORWH staff has been invited to update Dr. Sharon Hunter about the progress in considering sex as a biological variable. So this is a good news. People are getting more aware of it. Next, please. So Shansky and Murphy call for global shift in science culture and what they call what we consider rigorous must be a body of work that includes males and females in all experiments, except those that cannot be done in one sex. So it's an important publication and I will suggest you to read it. Next slide. I will highlight some funding opportunity announcements which ORWH has active. The first one is uh, a NOC, which is Notice of a Special Interest, Administrative Supplement to Promote Research Continuity and Retention of NIH Mentor Career Award. And uh, the next one is administrative supplement for uh, continuity of biomedical and biobehavioral research among first time recipients of NIH research projects and grants. And another is the NOCI also research on gender measurement. And then we have the intersection of sex and gender influences on health and disease. I talked about R01 program. And then the SCORE, which is a specialized centers of research excellence on sex differences. Next, please. Some important upcoming events. I will suggest you to register for this uh, Diverse Voice Virtual Talk session. And uh, then we have our 58th meeting of the NIH Advisory Committee on Research on Women's Health, which will be a virtual event. And uh, then we have seventh annual Vivian Pin Symposium on May 16th. And the topic is menopause and the midlife women. Then we have uh, a score annual meeting this will be closed, but uh, the keynote address will be open and then Birch annual meeting. Next, with this, I will stop and uh, just highlight other ORWH resources. You can subscribe for the Pulse, which is uh, a monthly newsletter or any other uh, uh, regular emails you will get. And next, please. Thank you so much. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Agarwal. So I am viewing some of the questions here in our Q&A, 
And uh, once again, if anyone has any questions, please submit them through the Q&A box. Um, so one of the most popular questions here so far is, um, what is the NIH policy for transgender, gender non-conforming individuals born as one sex, but have taken hormones to transition? Wonderful question. I will suggest you to look the website for SGMRO office as part of NIH office of the director. They have provided extensive data on this and the whole office is dedicated to transgender or non-conforming individuals. Please look at the website and uh, if necessary, please feel free to discuss with Dr. Karen Parker, who is the director of the office. Next, please. Hey, I have another question here. Um, it says, despite the noted difference between sex and gender, it seems like the term women is being used to only refer to cisgender women. In, in example, those assigned female at birth and identify as women. How do transgender men assigned female at birth identify as men and transgender women assigned male at birth identify as women fit into the SABV framework? Very good question again. And uh, we are working uh, with the SGMRO office, which deals with this issue, as well as with IC leaders, how to incorporate those transgender human beings as part of the big SABV policy. So we are working on it. Next, please. Okay, let's see, I have another one here. It says, what questions, excuse me, what guidelines currently exist for recording sex as a biological variable in human studies, which may include transgender and intersex individuals whose anato excuse me, anatomical, physiological, genetic, and hormonal characteristics may not fit neatly into binary male and female categories. For example, a trans man on HRT may have their sex recorded as female due to their anatomy and sex assigned at birth, but their hormonal and physiological characteristics are likely to resemble more closely those of people typically des designated male. What steps are being taken to ensure individuals with divergent biological sex characteristics are being included and considered in clinical research? Same. It's a wonderful question and it's on the same topic which we have discussed uh, in the previous two questions. So we are getting uh, the data as we speak and uh, SGMRO is leading a major role in how to get the data. So they have issued a number of funding opportunity announcements, including NOCES, which is Notice of a Special Interest, to encourage investigators to look at those transgender animals or transgender human beings and get the data so we can see where exactly the science is going. And based on the data, we'll be happy to incorporate or include them in other studies. So this is still growing up or this is a little bit, a little nascent field, you can say. So we are getting data, we are providing money to encourage investigators to look for those uh, changes. Next, please. Okay. Would it be possible to share the PowerPoint slides? I would I like think. to read someone, excuse me, I would like to read some of the articles mentioned, but the slides went by too fast to write the citations. So, uh, Daryl, I think the slides will be available if I remember. That is correct. The slides will be available. So they can, always look for those. And if you have any question, feel free to contact me or anyone at NIH and we will be happy to help you. Next, please. Okay, next one. Is the NIH working with medical professionals to make the changes to training programs so that PCPs, primary care physicians, can implement these new findings about biological female differences? Yes. We are working with the, the scientific community as well as the health practitioners. And we are giving seminars as well as developing these resources. And uh, as I mentioned, those e-learning courses, we had a good response from the caretakers. Either they are involved in hospitals or 
clinical trials as well as those clinicians. So people are getting aware by having those sessions as well as uh, the media is reporting also. So it is getting, or I should say the community is getting more aware of these differences. Next, please. Will the future research in pharmacokinetics ensure enforce the later phase trials be conducted with specific categorical determinants like sex or gender for future compliance with FDA approval? What is the NIH doing to encourage this in a real way? Great question. So we have been working uh, because FDA is a sister organization of NIH. We are part of HHS. We had uh, had multiple workshops and ongoing discussions to resolve this issue and how to proceed further. We just had a workshop uh, in, uh, I think in April, where we discussed with FDA, BARDA, ORWH and NIEID discuss sex differences in radiation research. And uh, so we are working very closely with other organizations of HHS, how to implement sex and gender in broader perspective. Next, please. Are there any funding opportunities to have patient reported gender and sex in electronic medical records? Okay, so the sex and gender administrative supplement program, which we had for a number of years, which started before the NIH SABV policy, it started in 2013. That the due date was uh, January 26, so you just missed it. I don't know whether the program will be renewed, but there it was open for investigators to request the money, additional money from NIH to look for the medical records or anything to look for sex and gender. And I will suggest you to get in touch with the SGMRO office because they do have administrative supplements program where they will give you additional money to look for uh, this gender or uh, whether binary or non-binary, that kind of research proposals. Next, please. Okay. Yes, what is the point of distinguishing between sex and gender at the onset, but not considering this distinction in the data presented? Not exactly sure what the person is asking. And that is the last of the questions that I have at this time. Just double checking to make sure there's nothing else. Yes, that, that is all the questions I have at this time. Okay. Um, if anyone else has any additional questions, please use the Q&A box to submit your questions. And the PowerPoint of this presentation has been posted. Please, please feel free to download it. Okay, so I do have additional questions at this time. Okay. Does NIH want to see all results supported by NIH separated by sex? Answer is yes. Unless or until you are working on one sex diseases, for example, cervical cancer, prostate cancer, then, but then the gender part will come in, but uh, yes, it should be disaggregated. Okay, and then here's another. Uh, looks like comment. It says, not a question, but just want to amplify the need for transgender and non-binary inclusion in biomedical research. It is so important. Agreed. Another comment here says, thank you, Dr. Agarwal, for presenting. This is interesting and important. Thank you. 
And here's another. Can SABV be considered if only women are enrolled in a trial? So it depends. Is it uh, a trial related with gynecological disease or is it related with pancreas? If it is pancreas and only women are enrolled, it is not right because men should also be. Sex as a biological variable policy is not only to account for women, but both men and women. As I mentioned in my presentation, majority of the research are being done using male animals or cells from males. So that's why we are saying include females. But if you are using only females, you have to use males. So you can see, is there any difference? Whether the dosing will be okay? What will be the PKPD for uh, the drug? So yes, you have to include both. Thank you. All right, let's see. For clarity, if we have more specific questions about how this policy applies in our work, should we be contacting the program officers in the individual IC that our work fits into? Absolutely. You should always be in touch with your program officer. That is your primary contact, but feel free to contact our office if you have some uncertainty or you are not sure how to move or you are not getting any answer, which I doubt, because ICs and ORWH work in collaboration as a team. It's not like they are doing their own work. Yes, we are doing our own work, but we work as a team and we educate each other, whether it is a policy or a scientific question. Ultimately, our goal or all the program officers or grants management specialists, our goal is to improve human health. And uh, everyone has its own role and responsibilities, but ultimately we represent NIH. I have another question here. What about limitations in funding, for example? With R21s, we're including sex as a biological, excuse me, sex as a variable would double the number of mice needed to reach a sufficient power. So, R21 is exploratory grant. You don't have to have a lot of preliminary data as well as, yes, it is for two years. You may limit the scope of the aims, what you are proposing, but you have to use SABV in R21 or even RO3 grants, which are even smaller than RO R21. So all the RPG grants or centers grant like PU, you have to include SABV. And regarding the doubling of the cost, it will not really double the cost. Sure, there will be, there may be some increase, but you put the budget accordingly as well as what is scientifically needed. And of course, the peer review will comment on it because they are also in the same boat. They are also trying to make sure that NIH gives the money for the best proposal and which are accounting for both SABV, sex and gender and everything in their research. So it will not really be a doubling. And uh, ultimately the question is, you are working and we are working to improve the health of human beings. Okay, and it looks like another question has been revisited but a little more um, detailed. It says, can SABV be considered if only women are enrolled in a trial? It is an intervention that is appropriate for women, an example, estrogen, but not men? Yes, so as I said before, in this case, the question will come here, are there any transgender women? And uh, so when, if you are looking for SABV policy, right now we are only saying SABV sex as a biological variable, but we want to have sex and gender part also. So this will be important for enrolling or accounting SABV. Ultimately, you want to have sex and gender, even though it is a women study, you are looking for estrogen effect, but there will be, unless all the women say they are all cis, 
then it is different. But if there are transgender women, you may want to have a representation. Next. I believe that that is all I have at this time. Okay. Um, if there are additional questions, once again, please um, submit into the Q&A box. Okay, nothing additional. Looks like we have, looks like two minutes remaining. Let's see. I wanted to thank all the audience for their wonderful questions and listening for the presentation. Great questions. And I really enjoyed giving this presentation. Thank you. Right. Do you have time for one last question, Dr. Agarwal? Yes, please. Okay. Last question is, is, are there any transgender, intersex, and or gender nonconforming NIH employees included on the committee developing these SABV policies? Huh. We do not ask people uh, their sexual preferences in any of those committees. and uh, But if anybody... And the best example here will be Dr. Karen Parker, who is leading the SGR Maru office. She has been invited in all those committees and working groups, either she or her staff, and they do bring sex and gender or the gender perspective in those discussions. So answer is yes and no because uh, people have not identified themselves. And if they do, or if they did, we do not discriminate based on sex and gender orientation. Everybody is welcome on the table. And especially Dr. Karen Parker has been advocating the gender orientation in all those research proposals. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Agarwal. Thank you.